So thanks very much for the kind words and uh, thanks to the organisers for the invitation. It really is a, a pleasure to be here at the McGill Summer School for the first time. And I've been saying to people over the course of the morning that I think it's really uh, a really important contribution that's been made here after the last 40 years to these really important public policy issues. Uh, and I hope that that uh, kind of debate and so on can be continued into the future. Um, so with Brexit looming, uh, which we've heard a lot about and I'm going to talk a bit more about now uh, in a few minutes, I think it's also important to put Brexit into the context of the global environment as well. And the global environment is also very uncertain. So we have this uncertainty globally and we have Brexit looming. Um, and really what I'm going to talk about is the need that uh, we should be ready to respond to the various risks that these uh, different outcomes pose uh, should they materialise. But at the same time, I think we have another challenge, and it's imperative that we're also really nimble and ready to cool a potentially overheating economy on the other side. Uh, so as a number of the speakers have, have already said this morning, it's really important that we're prepared. And I agree with that, uh, but in fact, my main message for today would go even further than that and say that we must not only be prepared, but we must be prepared to act. And we must ensure that overall our system is resilient and it must continue to function into the future come rain, hail or shine. Now, to paraphrase a remark attributed to Mark Twain, if you don't like the weather in Ireland, just wait a few minutes. <laughs> a bit like this morning here in Glenties. <laughs> the weather, of course, is something we all know that we can't control. It's not very consistent. And more importantly, it's something that can greatly affect the outcome of a trip. Now, the Irish economy is not dissimilar we're a small open economy, we're greatly exposed to the global environment, and we can't influence many of these outside factors. So we need to make sure that we're resilient to them, that we're prepared. When global times are good, we tend to do better. And similarly, when the global economy slows down, we are affected. So while we benefit a lot from global opportunities, we also need to ensure we build defences to the risks. Now, Brexit reminds me of the famous Robert Frost line when he said everything he'd learned in life could be summed up in three words. It goes on. <laughs> Brexit is a prime example of an external effect, event that can affect the Irish economy, and although it's unique to many of these other external and global risks that I mentioned, but it will touch on all realms of Irish life, socially, politically, and economically. And moreover, it's historically emotive, and due to its proximity, it's a risk that can overshadow all the others. However, focusing all our attention on that one risk is a bit like packing our suitcase full of rain gear with no sun cream. Now, Brexit is rightfully, though, forefront to many minds when we think about risks to the Irish economy, especially given the rising likelihood of a no deal or disorderly outcome. Just a couple of weeks ago at the bank, we published our revamped financial stability review. Now, even if you don't get a chance to read the whole report, I really would recommend reading the first couple of pages if you have time. They highlight what we see as the main risks currently facing the Irish economy and our financial system. But the report also addresses how we can build resilience to these risks. A disorderly Brexit is among the main risks that we identify on the horizon. And as the possibility of a no deal scenario looms ever larger, the uncertainty about the final outcome is already weighing on business and consumer sentiment. Now, within the bank, we've been working on Brexit since before the referendum even took place. And our work has focused on a few main areas. So let me talk to you about those for a couple of moments. First of all, understanding the possible effects of Brexit in terms of the risks to the Irish economy, to the financial system, and also to consumers. And since the referendum in June 2016, as many of you know already, the main impact so far has been felt through the depreciation of sterling against the euro. However, the significant trade and investment links with the UK mean that, as we've heard already from the panel, that the Irish economy is more exposed to the risks from the UK's departure than any other of our colleagues in Europe other than the UK itself. Now, a second focus of our work has been ensuring that Irish financial services firms understand and are planning for the impact of Brexit, the effect that it will have on their businesses, and importantly, making sure that they can continue to serve their customers after the UK departs the EU. The third area have been, we've been working on is wider contingency planning for the financial system and taking actions to mitigate what we see as the most important and immediate threats to the financial system. 
So ensuring there is no loss of market access for payment and settlement of equities and exchange traded funds, for example, has been a big part of that work. And finally, we've been dealing with the authorisation of new financial services firms. We've had well over 100 applications for either new licences or extensions to existing ones. And these applications vary from very large global banks to small investment funds and payment institutions. Now, overall, in terms of this very wide work that we've been doing on Brexit, we've tried to be as transparent as possible. So, for example, we've published our quarterly reports, which are prepared for the commission of the bank, our board of directors, albeit in somewhat redacted form on our website. Now, a no-deal Brexit would likely bring considerable volatility to financial markets with heightened stress and a potential further large depreciation of sterling. Following on from the global financial crisis and the crisis here at home, We've been working hard at the bank to build resilience in the financial system for the last decade. But our preparations over the last three years have been specifically focused on strengthening resilience to Brexit. And I would say that today the main outstanding risk to financial stability stems from a worse than expected macroeconomic shock. So a particularly sharp increase in uncertainty or a fall in confidence could lead to macroeconomic disruption. And the significant uncertainty around a hard Brexit makes the outcomes very difficult to predict. Our estimates, though, from our scenario analysis indicate severe and immediate disruptive effects from a no-deal Brexit, with Irish economic output estimated to be six percentage points lower after two years than we would otherwise expect. But as I said at the beginning, Brexit is not the sole risk. We're heavily exposed to the global environment, and the current outlook for the global environment is also somewhat unfavourable. Changes in world demand have a considerable impact on Irish exports, unemployment and wages. And thinking beyond Brexit, structural changes in the global economy, such as the ongoing trade tensions between the US and China, a global slowdown in investment, could also indirectly dampen Irish growth prospects. So in economic parlance, Ireland has a relatively high elasticity to global developments. Another risk comes from global financial markets. Against the backdrop of this lacklustre economic growth internationally, markets are reassessing the global outlook for growth, and an abrupt repricing of risk premium could lead to a rapid tightening of global financial conditions. Were that to happen, one of the effects would be that it could be more expensive to borrow for the state, for businesses, and ultimately for households. But that's the outlook for the international environment, but the economic performance of the domestic economy stands in stark contrast. So while we can shape and influence policies at European and wider international level, we can't necessarily dictate a response to international events, but we do have some more control as policymakers over domestic developments. Now, the Irish economy has had a remarkable recovery from the crisis, and this recovery has been broad-based across both export and domestic-oriented sectors. Irish employment levels are approaching an all-time high, and there are over 400,000 more people in work than at the low of the crisis in 2012. And wages are creeping upwards. The multinational sector, so crucial for jobs in Ireland, is also contributing significantly to the Exchequer, paying over three quarters of corporate tax receipts in 2018, and the corporate tax take has more than doubled since 2014. Meanwhile, there are also pressure points in the housing market, with rents continuing to rise. These are the kind of factors we generally associate with very strong economic performance, but they also point to an increased risk of an overheating economy, which we must be wary of. Now, having thought about uh, the kind of main risks, including how Brexit fits into this kind of wider global environment, let me turn for a moment to talk about how we can try and protect against them. I think that we really need to be ready to respond to any of these range of risks, should they materialise. At the Central Bank, our mission is to serve the public interest by safeguarding monetary and financial stability, and working to ensure that the financial system operates in the best interests of consumers and the wider economy. And reflecting that mandate, we are working to build resilience to and understand this range of risks that we face. As I mentioned, for example, we've undertaken substantial contingency planning for Brexit. Now, while the regulatory elements of our work play an important role, I'm going to focus for a few moments on our macro prudential tools, which we use to build resilience in the financial system 
and particularly how they affect borrowers and lenders. So first of all, thinking about lenders, a necessary part of protecting the resilience of the lenders is the completion of we, what we call the macro prudential framework for bank capital. I talked already about the small and open nature of the Irish economy. And while this brings many positives, this openness also increases the propensity and sensitivity of our economy to global shocks. And they can be different types of shocks. They can be structural, like Brexit, or changes in global trade or the international taxation regime, or they can be cyclical, which are more driven by global economic developments. In either case, it's important that banks hold sufficient buffers to guard against these higher level of macroeconomic risks in Ireland. On one hand, to guard against these cyclical risks, we've implemented what we call a counter-cyclical buffer, and this is set at 1%. Basically, the objective of this buffer is to make sure that we have a sustainable provision of credit to the economy. It means that the banks set aside more capital when times are good so that they can use that capital to absorb losses in tougher times. Meanwhile, beyond the economic and financial cycle, we're also using our policies and tools to build resilience to structural risks and shocks like Brexit. So, for example, following our request, we've recently received confirmation from the Minister for Finance and Public Expenditure and Reform that a legislative provision will be introduced to complete our macro prudential toolkit. This will give the bank the power to introduce a systemic risk buffer, which will help to counter structural shocks to the economy. This particular tool will aim to build resilience of banks to big shocks or tail risks by requiring them to have appropriate capital to absorb losses in case those risks were to crystallise. A central policy of our building resilience of lenders and borrowers is the mortgage measures, which we've had in place now for a number of years. These are particularly important given the inherent volatility of our economy. Now, neither the price level nor the level of growth of house prices are the objective of these measures. They are carefully calibrated to strengthen both bank and borrower resilience and to reduce the likelihood of a credit house price spiral emerging again. The mortgage measures are working as we designed them to, and they are also flexible enough to take into account the specific circumstances that we face. The system of allowances, for example, is in place that allows banks to lend above the mortgage measure limits. So to give an example, in 2018, one in eight loans to first-time buyers were above the loan-to-income limit of 3.5, and about 50% of these allowances were for loans issued with a loan-to-income ratio above 4. Looking at both first and subsequent borrowers last year, one-fifth of the value of total mortgage lending was issued with an allowance to the loan-to-income or loan-to-value limits. The framework, therefore, I think is sufficiently flexible and the allowances enable banks to take individual borrower circumstances into account. Now, to digress away from Brexit for a moment, we are acutely aware of the current challenges in the Irish housing market and the supply constraints. These challenges clearly impact on young couples and families, be they buying a new home or renting. But I see no evidence that more debt for these same young couples and families is the answer. More supply is and we have a pool of buyers chasing a limited number of properties at present. And the legacy of our last crisis, which we're still addressing in other fora, it's not the topic uh, for this particular session, but the legacy of that crisis of non-performing loans is a harsh reminder of what can happen when credit grows independently of income and fuels house prices. Our borrower-based measures aim to reduce the risks and hardships to household during a possible downturn or a house price shock and make them more resilient now and into the future. And as usual, we'll review the effectiveness of our measures in the autumn. Now, the variety of these macro prudential tools that I've talked about provide flexibility that we believe may be required in response to many shocks, be they domestic, Brexit or other global shocks. Standing alone, a disorderly Brexit would argue for accommodative policies. So, for example, allowing the automatic stabilisers to work and targeted fiscal measures for the most severely affected sectors. If any of the more global risks I described were to crystallise and have a significant effect on the domestic economy, they would likely pose a different set of challenges for us. So whether it's dealing with the effects of storms blowing in from abroad or having protection from sun on warm Irish summer days, the central bank stands ready to adjust, particularly the counter-cyclical capital buffer in either direction as the risk environment we face involves, evolves in order to support a sustainable supply of credit to the economy. 
So, as I said, we can't control the weather, but we must ensure that the system is resilient and continues to function into the future, come rail, hail, rain, hail or shine. Now, finally, I hope you allow me to take the liberty of speaking at an event like McGill to look briefly beyond our own toolkit at the Central Bank. As policymakers, we're here to serve the Irish public. The risks that we face often overlap. And it's beneficial for the public when our policy responses are in tune. So while the domestic economy is doing well, we have an opportunity now to boost our resilience to future shocks and risks. Prudent management of the public finances, for example, are also needed. Interest payments on the national debt are lower than expected and corporate tax receipts are high. But neither of these situations can be regarded as permanent. It's important that these funds are put to work to buffer against the next downturn or crisis and not to finance current expenditure or to boost an economy that's already close to capacity. A clear strategy guiding the use of unanticipated revenue inflows should be promptly established. Moreover, as we say frequently at the bank, the reduction of public debt ought to remain a key priority given its very high level. So to somewhat labour the analogy, which was also quoted earlier in the panel, we must fix the roof while the sun is shining. Now finally, as I said at the beginning, the global environment is uncertain and Brexit is looming and we must be ready to respond if risks materialise. But it's imperative that we are also nimble and ready to cool a warming economy if those risks were to dissipate. We must not only be prepared, but prepared to act. Thank you.